halfway point of the 2024 Rutgers football season. The Scarlet Knights are now 4-2, and 1-2 and in Big Ten play. Coming off back-to-back losses, including an extremely disappointing and discouraging 42-7 loss to Wisconsin this past Saturday. David Anderson is here to break down the first half of the season. We're going to go position by position. Obviously, the outlook looks a lot different today than it did last week. Uh, but David, thanks so much for being back. And let's just kind of jump into it. We'll see where this takes us. Uh, we'll start on the offensive side of the ball. Let's start with quarterback. So I think that that's one of the most frustrating things about this 4-2 and two start is that you've gotten one win in a game where Ethan Kelly man is through for a lot of yards. but And he, he seems to be able to complete the ball. Um, we'll get to the receivers in a minute, but they were only credited with four official drops on Saturday against Wisconsin. But, I mean, pretty much almost every pass he threw other than one throwaway in the first half was a catchable ball. And so that's probably what's a little bit discouraging. But he really has shown some command of the offense. I think that he's not the reason that the team is struggling so much right now. I'm not saying he can't play better, but, I mean, is this an upgrade from the quarterback play a year ago? Yes. Is this probably the best quarterback play that you've had since 2014? I would say probably yes. All that to say, though, he's only got, I think, 1,050 yards on the season, which puts him slightly below the pace that we were all kind of talking about in our crossover preseason show that 2,200 yards seemed roughly reasonable for him. So, again, I think I think you could probably win some games if you can just protect him a little bit better. And then, I guess, glad to see that a Johnny Shepard got some burn in the second half against Wisconsin because – even if it's just a change of pace or if you just want him to go in there to do some of those push, tush, push runs, I see no reason why he couldn't have the same success as Gavin Wimsett. And then at least you feel like he's got some more reps under his belt, even if he's not throwing the ball much. So that's just my quick assessment of the quarterback position. Uh, did you have any other thoughts comparing to what our preseason expectations were? Other than that, I mean, he seems mostly healthy other than the Nebraska game. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's hard to judge based on your point that you just made was that, you know, he did throw a lot of catchable balls in that loss. Is His uh, completion percentage for the season now is hovering just over 52%. Obviously, that's not good enough, but at the same point, uh, he has been a lot more accurate. Uh, He was very accurate in the short and midterm earlier in the season, and he hasn't been, you know, completely off the rails in terms of not being accurate in those passes still. There's been a lot of drops, a lot of misreads. Uh, from receivers and things like that. So I, 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 we wanted to see that closer to 60%. It's not there, but I, as you pointed out, I don't think it's all his fault. Um, but just in terms of his offense, they average 175 yards passing per game. That's rated 16th out of 18 teams in the Big Ten. Obviously, uh, closer to kind of season expectations, as you mentioned, is on pace for 2,100 yards passing for the year. But uh, just in terms of looking at how the Big Ten is right now, uh, you know, it's much more of a uh, open offense uh, league than it used to be. Obviously, part of that is the Pac-12 teams coming in. Uh, You have predictably Iowa below Rutgers, uh, as always. And then Michigan's actually dead last. And and those quarterback struggles have been well documented. Uh, But when you have uh, 12 other, 13 other offenses, well over 200 yards passing, I think it just speaks to... Rutgers, uh, the limitations they have in terms of their offensive game plan overall and their ability to potentially come back in games. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that's probably the most discouraging is that we did see when they needed a play against Virginia Tech in the pass game, they got it. Against Nebraska, when they needed some plays in the pass game, they got several up until that very last drive. They moved the ball. Obviously, the Ben Black, you know, drop. Like, he made some big-time throws. And then, you know, do I think Ethan Kallik Manis is one of the better quarterbacks in the Big Ten? No. Is he one of the worst quarterbacks in the Big Ten? No. If he was on a functional team, I think he would be having more success. The only thing that's starting to concern me a little bit that I wouldn't have even said was a red flag preseason, but is his ball just not catchable? Because last year, the Minnesota dropped a zillion passes for him. And now Rutgers is dropping some as well. So 
I don't know what it is, but it's something – maybe it's the receivers, but I, I just – it seems like he should be producing more than he is based on how his reads have seemed pretty good. His ball seems fairly accurate. Uh, so hopefully hopefully that you know they just figure out a couple things on offense and can do better. But again, uh, to take a quick step back, I mean, 4-2 and two coming into this point in the season, any other year back to 2014 – we would have signed up for that in a second. So clearly the expectations are high. I think the problem is just like we saw last year with this same head coach, same offensive coordinator, they hit a skid late in the season and it didn't seem like they could climb back until they had a complete bowl prep period of time. So we'll probably circle back to coaching at the end, but you know, I'm not, I felt like Kelly Manis has done slightly more than you could have expected. Like he took that, uh, first down carry, first play mm-hmm. I think it was for nine yards, and then when they hadn't had a first down since the play right after that, he tucked it and he ran hard again after guys were dropping the ball. So I think he's doing his part, but he's just not good enough to really elevate an offense. But when you look at the Big Ten, how many quarterbacks can even do that? I- I'm not really sure. So overall, I mean, again, I think can he play better? Yes. If he maintains this level of play, do I think they'll this level of play is at right now over the past two weeks? Do I think they'll win at least two more games, maybe three? Yes, for him, specifically talking about him. Yeah, I agree. I think one thing he's consistently shown is he's been able to bounce back from adversity. You know, when they had nothing going in that game, he had that scramble, and then he connected with Dremel soon after that with a 36 yard. It got him down to the 10 yard line on three plays. Uh, they weren't obviously able to finish. Uh, but I, I think, honestly, that's more scheme and, and play call than, than his play. Uh, but in terms of just the offense as a whole, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I think it's hard to complain about him solely. Obviously, the quarterback does get the, the bulk of the blame. But let's move on now to wide receiver, talking about the passing game. Uh, overall, your thoughts on this group, how they progressed, and uh, I guess what you feel like their outlook is for the rest of the season. It's really hard to say with the injury to Ian Strong because he was really starting to play well. And kind of when we look back at last year, so many things broke right for them as a group. In wide receiver, they avoided injuries other than the one to Chris Long for the most part. And they were able to get through the season significantly enough. I mean, I think the most positive takeaway is that a healthy Strong does – give you something you weren't sure you're were going to have at the beginning of the season. That's number one. Number two is, I mean, Demir Miller, I think what concerns me is I thought that coming from uh, Minnesota where he had Daniel Jackson, that Kirk Schrock had got a ton out of Daniel Jackson. And we have just seen them struggle to get the ball last year to Chiquay Jackson. And then this year to Demir Miller in spots that you would think he could make plays. Now there was a play against Wisconsin where they, they actually did run a nice change-up play where he kind of went into the backfield, ran out, and they threw a quick pass. It was only like a third and three or third and four, and I don't know how. He didn't get it. I mean, Ben Black got a one block on a guy. He basically blocked two guys for a second, and like one guy just kind of swatted at Miller, and he kind of tripped him up. But I, I think that for the most part, he runs routes to the sticks. He makes plays. He can run a little bit after the catch, and if he could have gotten him the ball a little bit more with – room to run against Wisconsin secondary, he probably could have made some plays. So that's one of those places where you really got to go back to the drawing board. Like Shigano said in his presser post game, what can we do? What, what, forget the opponent. What can we do better? And I think Demir Miller is a guy that we've talked about, but then at the same time, you add in the wrinkle of Dremel. He made probably the best two catches of the game. And so they got to figure out how to play him and Miller. I don't know if you're going to, kind of come up with crazy ways to do it putting a guy in the backfield motioning him out i don't know what it's going to take but you got to do something and so i do think that you know maybe we can get dremel back in the game just as a reliable guy but that's been a struggle i do think kj duff has been what we expected and so that's you know make a couple plays have a drop here and there maybe his route tree isn't as experienced and then um other than that at receiver there hasn't been any emergence from the guys who we thought were going to step up last year as freshmen. So that's, that's also discouraging, but overall, I think that the receiving group just has more drops than we expected. But other than that, like 
I really didn't expect that much more from these guys. I think so, I probably was bear, more bearish than anybody else on the receiver group heading into the season than anyone else in our predictions, fan base, anything like that. I mean, they're just probably about as good as I thought they would be. But if they catch a few more balls, you throw for 100 yards more last game and yep. you move on. So I guess the only thing that's negative is Chris Long just drops way too many passes. That's been a killer. He dropped that one against Wisconsin that was kind of in his chest when they're at the goal line. And then he also dropped another one uh, earlier in the game that was just right in his hands. If there's any DB anywhere near him, they just knock the ball out. So if you're talking about personnel changes, like I always like Chris Long, but he he's borderline unplayable unless he can be so wide open. And even then he dropped two in the last two weeks. So I think that's probably the only discouraging part. Everybody else has kind of been what we thought. Nobody's really been way better except for maybe Ben Black, who I think has done an admirable job blocking. And so, you know, I think Ben Black's just going to continue to take reps from Chris Long, and then they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do on that other side. But for the most part, I would say this receiver group's been kind of roughly what I expected, but that's probably lower than most people's expectations heading into the season. Yeah, I think everything you said is extremely fair. I, I think in terms of uh, – strong you know we both had high hopes for him to be able to emerge and he struggled a little bit there in the beginning and then really came on the injury i think has really hurt the offense uh, as much as anyone even you could argue felter obviously the offensive line has a ton of issues since then but i think strong is just that playmaker for them especially in the red zone uh that you know they've really been missing he obviously has been on the field but he's not the same uh ben black you're right has has showed signs in multiple ways uh, and and the, the whole, you know, Miller and Dremel thing, they're both in the slot. You can't play them at the same time. I don't know. I mean, Miller, they did move him out of the slot at times earlier this season. I think at, at this point, you know, part of what Shiano's comments is reevaluate, right? And what can they do better? I think you just have your, you got to have your best players on the field. And, yeah. you know, Dremel, for his lack of athletic ability or talent, uh, you could argue is, is definitely part of the heartbeat of this offense. He was last year. And I think yeah. him, you know, he was obviously battling things at the start of this year in terms of injuries, but he, he made some great plays in that game. To be, I think it says a lot for him, his character, in terms of not having to catch all season, finally getting some reps, limited, albeit, but 10, 10 snaps, two, bit, two of the best catches in the game. Uh, I, I think he's just he deserves more, and they need to figure it out uh, in terms of utilizing them both. And I, I, I agree with it. I don't think they've utilized Miller nearly enough or correctly in terms of getting him out in open space. So uh, I, I don't think the receivers are, you know, an F or D or anything like that, but they also are, are, haven't elevated the offense in a way that we had hoped. Uh, let's talk offensive line next, uh, just in terms of uh, kind of a almost like two different reports based on how they were before Felter and post Felter. Dramatically different so far. Obviously the competition different as well. Your thoughts on the offensive line? Yeah, well, I won't relitigate what was talked about on the post game show for the night report, where they also had Larry Kay from Nightwatch as a guest, where they went through the offensive line commits from the class that had seven guys. I think it was the 2021 class, uh, maybe 22, but I think it was the 2021. And basically, he lost four of the seven guys to medical retirement. And then the other ones are Taj White, Dante Chin, and Amir Stanett. And Stinnett was always viewed as a, as a project because he came in at such a high weight. But it's just the fact that your left guard goes down, a guy who was considered probably not big and strong enough to play at the Big Ten level anyway early in his career, and they kind of discounted it. For him to go down and your line to completely implode is a really, really bad sign. If you want to talk about the number one concern I have, this entire team for the entire season it's the offensive line in the run game because they were just getting manhandled by a team that runs a two defensive two down linemen attack uh defensively last week and so i mean terrence salami for example there was one play when he had to come in and i think it was seven nothing Rutgers calls a good play first down i think it was a drop second down they got kyle Manungai running out to the left side and uh, no, I guess that was first down. Common on guys run to the left, plays the design going well, and he just gets absolutely blown up backwards, which completely disrupts the play. Manungai jukes one guy, 
And then he still gets tackled in the backfield. It was one of the only good spots Rutgers got all day that they only credited him with a loss of one, but probably should have been a loss of four. But it was just one guy breaking down. I mean, that's so that's the first thing. I, I can't believe that losing Brian Felter would be this impactful. I don't know if this is on the OC. I don't know if this is on the strength and conditioning staff. I don't know if this is on Coach Pat Flaherty, who we've praised for so long. But you, if you can't find a left guard, that's like one of the easiest positions that you should be able to find somebody to at least play serviceable when you're a Big Ten team. So I think if it were me, I think the move would be to move Kobe Asamoah to the left side. And that's because I think we have more guys that we trust on the right hand, a right side of the of the line. And I'm not sure what you do from there. And you know, you don't. You're trying to just fix one part, so maybe you shouldn't shift everything around. But what they were doing last week was not working at all. Uh, they went to several guys. Nobody was getting the job done. But again, and you're next to Holland Pierce, who's six foot eight and three hundred and thirty something pounds. Like you would think, you could protect that as your like weakest spot in the line when you have him next to it. So I think Holland Pierce has had a good season, probably similar to last year. He did struggle against Wisconsin with them just running past him on the outside. They were doing a good job disengaging, but he's had a good season. Gus Zelinskis had a tough game against Nebraska, but he's been kind of the same. Uh, Tyler Needham, he's had a couple rough ones a little bit in run blocking, but I guess the bigger problem is just they don't seem to be better. The sum of the part is not – the sum is not – okay, it's – the, what is it? the phrase for me? They're not acting like greater than the sum of the parts on offense, right. which last year their offensive line did. And so I don't know what changed from last year, this year, like Curtis Dunlap, not here, but other than that, I mean, Reggie Sutton's heart. I don't know what else to say about why they're not performing to the same level, but they, I think they need to just play with a little bit more raw aggression. Maybe they need to simplify their blocking, but for the most part, I mean, offensive line has to get, if you were grading, probably a C minus. And that's really a disappointment from where we thought they would be. Rutgers can't just run for two or three yards a carry when they want to. Uh, the only thing I will add is they have been good in tush push situations. So as much as I hate it, I think that in short yardage, Rutgers is going to have to go back to that because the plays that they're calling are not working other than that in short yardage. Yeah, great points there. I think in terms of uh... – the reality check we've seen the last two games when they've gone up against legit Big Ten fronts on the defensive side, the offensive line has just gotten completely pushed around. And it, you know, when when your when your game plan, when your identity is running the football, and you can't do that, obviously uh, it messes everything up. And I think that uh, that is a key fundamental problem with this program right now is that they want to win a certain way, and they don't have the personnel to do it, specifically up front. So. I think that has been a big wake-up call just in these last two weeks. I do think, and we can kind of segue maybe, unless you want to touch anything on offensive line, but I think part of it too is the tight ends have really struggled with blocking this year. And I think, uh, and, and I, I thought this last year, I think Johnny Langer for all his, um, you know, maybe lack of uh, talent or natural ability as a receiver, although he was pretty solid, he was a great blocker for this team last year, and I think they're sorely missing that on the tight end side this year uh, that the offensive line doesn't kind of have that extra help on the edges. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. That When they went for that fourth down play, they did replace a tight end with an extra lineman, which I think is something they need to do, and it was equally ineffective, so I don't know if that was necessarily <laughs> on the tight ends this past week. But I agree. I mean, Kenny Fletcher, man – I don't know if this contributed to his drops, but he was had a lot of heavy collisions with Wisconsin defenders and did not come on the right end of most of them. I mean, he held his ground a few times, but they were just hitting him. Like they, they were so prepared defensively at Wisconsin. Again, I have to tip my cap to their coaching staff in all three phases. They really were prepared for Rutgers and just the fact that they could impact plays by like shoving tight ends into the backfield was a factor. I mean, the, the biggest, MIA is probably Victor Kanapka because after Fletcher came out of the game, they did go to Mike Higgins who yeah. had a drop. Then they kind of didn't even try to throw it to him. And he's just not in there for his blocking. Like he's a guy who I would see maybe in his fourth year in the program, he might be, you know, a guy who you would trust to block, but that's more of when we talk about development, that's, that's the type of thing I would expect from a guy like him. And so they just have not been able to find that blocking tight end. As much as we rip on Sean Bowman last year for not reaching his potential, he yep. was just so big 
that he was able to kind of get by a little bit better. Uh, and then they, they've never had the success they had in 20 and 21 when Giovanni Haskins was effectively an extra offensive lineman. So I think that that's a huge problem with this offense. It's just that if you're not getting blocking from your tight end position, you got to figure something else out. You saw early in the season when they switched Fletcher from an inline blocker to getting him in motion, pulling more. So they did make an adjustment early in the year, but does Soraka just need these six foot seven, like monster tight ends to run his offense as a blockers? I mean, I think that's just some of the questions that are starting to pop up amongst the fan base and even the Big Ten media at large is like, is the only reason they had success with Mo Ibrahim and some of those other teams at Minnesota just because they had more blocking from especially the tight end spot? I mean, it's a reasonable question to ask. And if the answer is yes, well, you got to cut your losses and come up with something else. Go for wide receivers if you have to. I don't really like doing that, but what they're doing is not really working. And all the teams that they're going to face in the next couple of weeks are going to play the same exact way. So you're probably going to have to change something or, you know, get lucky in some way. I don't know what else to say other than, you know, every team is going to try the same blueprint that Nebraska and Wisconsin did about crashing the run as soon as you do a handoff or fake a handoff, which means you got to either run play action repass options something or you just got to maybe go four wide i don't know what the answer is but it's not what they've done the last two weeks because we've seen it two weeks in a row now it's not working but let me ask one one last thing about the tight end position i think last year they only got 18 catches from tight ends on the whole season and kenny fletcher already has 20 so that's another thing that makes this uh kind of fall off of the offense so discouraging is you're getting more accurate quarterback play you're getting something out of your tight end spot in the receiving game. Why is your offense worse? And so that's kind of a glass half empty, half full thing from the tight ends. It's like you are getting stuff in the receiving game. So theoretically that should offset some of the negatives that you have in the, in the blocking game, but they haven't been able to leverage that successfully uh, in the last two games. Yeah. And that's what makes it so frustrating is that last year teams put eight in the box and, Obviously, the top competition was able to shut Rutgers down in the run game, but Rutgers also had success in the run game despite that, despite everyone knowing it's coming. And then this year, they have a little bit more of a dynamic pass game, and they can't run it at all when those teams are loading up. And I think what really epitomizes the struggles of the offense, and I tweeted this today, was that, you know, their, their most consistently productive offensive play of the last two seasons is Kyle Manungai making a cut or a move behind the line of scrimmage and breaking free and when yeah. that's your, your best play that's obviously not by design and it just i think just shows how uh how much they've struggled in terms of building any type of consistency um not just with you know Manungai who uh has made the most out of like as you mentioned i mean he's turning big losses into shorter losses right uh, that that doesn't show up as value in the stat sheet if you're not seeing it in action but i think it's just it's it's Equally frustrating, too, because you have a talent like Manungai who really isn't getting help again a second year when you thought you had other elements in place that would elevate his play in the entire offense. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a natural transition to talk about the running back spot where I think we've gotten probably what we expected from Sam Brown, maybe a tad more than was reasonable, uh, other than it seems like he ha he may be injured. And then Kyle Manungai... To my eye, he's been as good as last year. I mean, when when I, I just rewatched the first half of the Wisconsin game this 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 morning, and he was fine. In fact, it's he's so fine that that's why Wisconsin was basically any time they saw Rutgers even do a, a play action, every linebacker was biting on it. I mean, they were biting on every play action, RPO, everything, and so that should give you enough that you can complete some play actions, some RPO passes, just their linebackers are respecting the run. They're biting on it every time. When you see them get a little bit of space, just a little crease, I think what Wisconsin was fearing in that game was exactly what happened on Rutgers' lone touchdown, which was if you don't hit Menungai at the line or behind it, and he gets a little bit of momentum, guys are just kind of hanging on for dear life, and he's just continuing to move forward. I think that he was victimized by what ultimately was the drive right before they got stopped on fourth down. He was for sure face masked by at least one guy, maybe two. And it should have been a 15-yard penalty. Uh, instead, 
he, I mean, he got four yards on it, but it should have been first and goal from basically like the, or first and 10, maybe from the 11 yard line. I think they were around the 25. And so I, and then they were complaining about that in the Washington game when he got face masked a few times, but they only called one, uh, which was maybe one of the softer of the three. But I mean, guys are still struggling to take him down. He seems like he has fresh legs. He's probably your most reliable guy in pass protection, like maybe even more than the lineman at this point. And so I, I just I just can't say enough about him. But it just goes to show you, like we weren't delusional when we were saying that against you know behind a better offensive line, Isaiah Pacheco would have ran for a lot more yards. Well, the same thing is true for Kyle Manungai this season right now. I just I don't know what else you can do for him because defenses are just even if they're not run, stacking the box, as soon as it looks like it might be a run, they're sending every available run defender to try to stop in the backfield. Because once he gets loose, you know, there, there are very few eight yard runs. They're either four or less, or he's going to pop you for 15 or 20. And so I give him credit for coming back this year. And he's been as, as good as you could possibly imagine. The one thing I'll say that ties running back and line, the offensive line is that, I do think, like I mentioned earlier in the season, one thing that concerned me was too many times he's waiting for the blocking to set up. It never sets. Mm -hmm. And so I think either he's going to have to run with different pacing personally, or it might be time to break out the old Jay Sean Benjamin, like quick handoff, just run straight up the gut to get a few yards. I do think they need to change the, the, the tempo in the run game to try to keep defenses off balance. Right now it feels like every run play has the same like speed that it's happening. And so linebackers and safeties are just timing it right. Whereas if you do a couple quicker ones, then they're going to have to start trying to get in there quicker, but you're willing to take maybe a three yard gain as long as you're not losing yardage. And I think last year we undersold how helpful that was that they were using Benjamin and Menungai in different ways Whereas now it's everyone who's in there, whether it's Brown, whether it's Raymond, whether it's Manungai, every run play has the same timing. And I think it's letting defenses just tee off in the run game. So that's an area that I don't think maybe Manungai can adjust a little bit, but it's also dependent on the coaching, working with the offensive line and the backs that, hey, guys, we've got to do some things timing wise to keep them off balance, which I think they're scared to do because they're rotating so many linemen. That's much easier to do when you have chemistry on the line. But uh, that's the only thing I could possibly say negative about Common guy who's otherwise done everything they've asked for again. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. And, and you're totally right. I mean, it, it, that leads to their predictableness, right? They're not, it's not only that they're not doing things really differently. They're not trying to disguise or show things differently either. And it's pretty easy for the defense to uh, catch on. In terms of production, Manunga is actually way ahead of last year. He's already at 750 yards for the season. He's on pace for 1,500 last year, just over 1,100. He's averaging five and a half yards a carry, second most in the Big Ten. In conference play, he's seventh right now. Uh, he averages four and a half yards a carry and 94 yards a game In after these two losses where the offensive line wasn't good at all. So that right. just speaks volumes to how good he actually has been. Uh, and uh, without – that, that's what's scary, too, is the fact that, you know, Rutgers is going to have to have an offense without Kyle Manunga next year. And he has been their shining light for two years now, uh, way above anything else they've had. So uh, that's certainly uh, frustration just in terms of having a back like him and, and not being able to advance the offense more than they have. Any closing thoughts on offense before we move to defense? Yeah, I mean, I think that it goes back to what we talked about last year, why they had success. Because you have something you can go to, a bread and butter, and this year they don't have it. I mean, that's why they only sustained three drives against Washington. That's why late in the game against Virginia Tech, they couldn't move the ball at all. It's it's because there's nothing that they can go to that they can get just three yards. What well, last year was three yards, now is sometimes negative one. And so when that happens, you know, I, I think – there might be a time for a shakeup. And I didn't want to say, again, we didn't like totally talk about coaching, but Kirk Shiraka, he really has six more games to prove that, hey, if I have a little bit better development from the existing linemen or better offensive linemen or better blocking tight ends, that this can be successful. But, I mean, you saw all around the country how many teams are doing 
more with less on the offense, even in the Big Ten alone? And the answer is a lot. And so that's probably the most discouraging thing is, you know, I think Chirac is a good OC for the most, he's above average. He's out coached several defensive coaches already this year, but the results just aren't there. So I don't know what they're going to do, but I, they got to do something different or else we're going to look back and be like, well, at least we know why Shiano went to Gleason when he first got back. It's because it was more unpredictable. There were some games that were terrible, but we would have expected a game like this. Under Shiraka, you don't expect a game like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great point. I have to ask, you made me think about it as you were talking about that, which was a great point about Shiraka. How much do you think not having Gavin Wimsett or a run first or a, uh, a heavy threat to run and we've debated this in the past and Wimsett, I think, you know, made some bad reads as a runner last year and wasn't the most uh, effective running quarterback by any means, but he did have that explosive factor. How much do you think that is a, a, a contributing factor to their uh, step back as a run team this year? Very little, almost zero. The reason I would say almost zero is because with Wimsett, you know that they were running even on third and eight. And even if they didn't get it, that was just another body blow, another body blow, another body blow. And I think that there's a tendency for teams that start to throw a little bit more that, yeah, you can kind of start thinking you're a finesse team. Like every receiver thinks they're great. Everybody thinks they're a great passing team until they're not. But that is so minimal in terms of what this offense's problems are. If they were blocking in the run game last year like they are now, it wouldn't have it wouldn't matter if you had you know Denard Robinson or Tommy Frazier running your as your quarterback. It wouldn't matter. Like th- that's how thing bigger, much bigger. I think the offensive line problems are than the quarterback running. If anything, it's actually better because Kelly Manis has been able to tuck and run a few times and yep. supplies a defense on first downs they wouldn't have otherwise got. So I think I think very little, if at all, possibly zero. I agree with you. I, I just know that there's some fans that are starting to, to broach that question or subject. And I, I think that that was important for us to address. Uh, and I think his biggest value was that, you know, on fourth and short with that tush push. But as you said, you know, there's other, there's other ways to use that play with the personnel they have currently. So moving on to the defense, uh, obviously he's taken a major step back since last year, multiple reasons for that. Let's start along the defensive line. Yeah, I mean, I guess first, before we even talk about that, I, I, I said this in my off-tackle empire coverage. No Big Ten team outside of Ohio State, maybe Penn State or Oregon, is going to have a good defensive game if they're missing their five best defensive players. Nobody. Absolutely not. And so, yes, I know you've been missing Moturay for the entire season. Fine. But you're, you're missing Powell and Longerbeam, and then Aaron Lewis goes down like the first or second drive, and then um, – or Flip Dixon, who was having, for the most part, a pretty good half when I rewatched it, uh, gets injured late in the first half as well, and he'd been dealing with injuries all season. But nobody's gonna sus- nobody's gonna sustain that from this second tier that we're talking about. Nobody. So that's the first thing is we have to look back at last year and see how healthy they were defensively. They had what Max Melton playing with a, a, a broken hand allegedly, and then once he was healthy, Tyreen Powell missed the rest of the season. Other yeah. than that, they pretty much had everybody for the most part, other than Renee Conga, who they really miss right now. And so defensive line, I thought in real time, I thought they were getting destroyed in on Saturday's game in the first half. Uh, but in the, but then when I rewatched it, I mean, there were drives in that half where you had up front Walker, um, Jelani Walker, right? Or Jordan Walker, Jordan Walker, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jordan Walker. Kashawn Griffin, um, Abdul Rahman, and like Troy Rainey, or sometimes Ayurian Goy, and they were fighting that offensive line for Wisconsin and not letting themselves get blown back. So, if anything, I think the run defense has been um, holding up at the point of attack as well as they were last year, if not better. I think that it's taken some time for some of these guys to get reps. I mean, I think we went through in the preseason, like how few snaps even Kashawn Griffin has had at this point in his career, because there's so many guys. Keontae Hamilton was a little up and down, but he played a good game fairly two weeks ago. 
I think that this defensive line, again, just watching the first half, I think that the wheels fell off in the second. But they were playing hard, and they were setting the tone. And it was more a couple long plays, a couple missed tackles at the second level. And so do they still have no pass rush? Pretty much. But in terms of if you're trying to compare apples to apples, like where they were last year as a run defense, where they were this year as a run defense, it's about the same. And the pass rush, even with Lewis injured, even with no Toure, their pass rush, other than having no Toure last year, is about the same. Now, Wesley Bailey, I think he had a pretty bad game against Wisconsin. Hopefully he can bounce back. But they are finding guys to play on the defensive line, uh, plus Malcolm Ray, who's kind of been up and down. He's had some great moments, and he's gotten pushed out a few times. But from a defensive line standpoint, I think this is kind of where we start getting into the territory of, like, unless you have a really, really dominant defensive line, everybody else's defensive line in the conference even is pretty average. And they're not going to win or lose games for you as long as you're not just getting gouged by runs up the middle, which they really weren't for what the part of that game that was competitive. And so am I pleased with their play? I mean, I don't know if pleased is the right word, but this is roughly what we should have expected coming into the season. Probably yes. We would have liked another pass rusher to emerge. Um, Walker is really improving fast, but this kind of goes back to the offensive line too. When you've been in this uh, for five years, I know it takes time to recruit linemen, but you're basically your best pass rusher is a walk-on converted tight end. That's your best pass rusher right now. And that is more of a, a bigger picture problem than something you're going to resolve over these last six weeks of the season to, you know, just make sure that you don't take a huge step back as a program. Yeah. And I think that hits the nail on the head in terms of if this is a developmental program, then we're, we're seeing holes in the, in the too deep. And that's what I hope done on my last pod is that, you know, we're not talking about, we're not down to the third and fourth string in certain positions. Like we're talking about the too deep where the backups and Shiano even said, well, the, you know, the backup came in and, wasn't the starter, but that's that's the whole point of being a developmental program is you don't have that fall off a cliff when the backup comes in and, and being where they're at in year five, it is concerning that they haven't established. I mean, we've talked about the defensive line depth for so long and in the Big Ten, how good teams have eight to ten guys that can rotate with not much drop off. And Rutgers just hasn't been there at all at all since Shiano's been back. Um, and the fact that it doesn't seem like I mean, to your point, they did keep fighting along that line in this game, but they're, they're not getting the production. They're not getting the consistent push. They're not getting the pressure. Uh, they're, they're not getting results that they need to get. And I think that that's a big concern moving forward, just in terms of if it is a developmental program and you're not getting plug and play guys out of the portal. Uh, that's, you know, when are you going to see that change in terms of that development skew? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One, when you look at the recruiting classes, like you look at the one they're trying to keep for this year, right? They've got to at least hit a bowl game to keep this class intact. I know Shiano said in his presser, well, if a guy's going to decommit after one game, it's not the type of guy we want in the program. It's like, yeah, if it's one game, that's fine. Right. right. But if these issues continue to persist for the next couple of weeks, that's a huge problem because I think this defensive line class that they have currently verbally committed, they have some of these guys that are going to push the pocket that are going to be able to play earlier in their careers. Like Kashawn Griffin is a good example. He seems adequate in run stopping right now after not sniffing the field for a first couple of years. But they need more than that than right now. I mean, Troy Rainey, I almost want to say this about the offense, 2021, they switched him from defensive line to offensive line. He started in the game against Michigan that they lost 20-13 to to the eventual Big Ten champions, and they were pushing them all over the field in the run game in the second half up until that last, you know, up until the red zone, basically. So do I want them to put Troy Rainey back on offense? Hopefully not. But, you know, that just kind of goes to show you a guy who played two years ago at left guard that you would think you're so far along that on the offensive line. And then defensive line, we're kind of saying the same thing, but they battled. I mean, man, Nebraska could not move the ball on them. And then this week, I felt like the first half, Wisconsin got a little lucky. I mean, the first first down conversion they got, three guys were held. Jordan Thompson, terribly held. Timmy Heinz better coming from the linebacker spot, was basically grabbed from behind, like horse-collared, 
And then somebody else I, along the line, was, I think it was a left end, was just completely grabbed until it was he was let go. And so I think that some of it also comes from veteran leadership. Like if you're inexperienced on the defensive line, there's so many little tricks and things that happen in close proximity that like the refs can't see. And so maybe there's some of that as well. But again, I, I think we're starting to realize last year they were picked up by being able to use Motore on the line as well as just linebackers cleaning things up without the defensive line completely blowing up plays in the backfield. If anything, I would bet you that the defensive line has blown up more plays in the backfield for the first half of this year than they did all of last year. I mean, there were several plays against Wisconsin where even down 14, nothing, 21, nothing. And they were collapsing the, the, the run play, like sniffing it out significantly more than we even saw a year ago. So, I mean, hopefully Aaron Lewis is healthy because he's the only guy who can generate pass rush. But again, I think the defensive line is where we thought it would be and probably even as good, if not slightly better than they were last year. And they're still struggled the last two. And again, two weeks ago, they only gave up 14 points. So we're really talking about one game. Right, right. That, Maybe two if you want to count Washington because they gave up a zillion yards. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I guess the bigger concern now is that, you know, from a ceiling perspective, for, for Rutgers to really make a leap in the Big Ten, you, you can't have games like you had in the trenches, you know, obviously much more so as a concern on the offensive line, but defensive line too. I mean, even if they're just as good or a little bit better than we thought, they're, they're still not near that, that top half of the Big Ten right, right. from a defensive line standpoint. So. Until Rutgers can can truly develop a pipeline along the offensive and defensive lines through recruiting, through the portal, I, I think it's going to be really hard for this program to take a, a, a tangible leap up the, the standings, um, you know, and, and move that ceiling much past seven or eight wins. And until that happens, I just, I don't know. You're seeing the major difference. I mean, Washington and Virginia Tech, you know, uh, the, the, you could just see the difference uh, in the trenches compared to the, and, and the Nebraska defense. The Nebraska offense, you're right. I mean, the Rutgers defense did a great job. That was their best game by far. But even so, I think the wear and tear of that game impacted them in this Wisconsin game. And I think you don't have the depth to back it up. So I just think that that's a real – you mentioned in terms of the offensive line, I think uh, as your biggest concern with the team and overall, I think it's it also expanding just to the trenches on both sides of the ball. And we've seen it so many years last year, November, Penn State, Iowa – Rutgers just can't compete when it comes to those types of teams and, and not necessarily expecting them to do that this year. Luckily, they don't play them. But even against that middle-level uh, Big Ten team, you know, it's been a big problem. Yeah. I mean, I think that when that happens, first of all, considering how much they were not just like blowing up the backfield the last two weeks, again, I'm really looking at the Nebraska game the first half against Wisconsin because, to your point, I think they were just out of gas in the second half against Wisconsin. Yeah partially from the Nebraska game, yeah. but they are, even when guys are not getting good push, they're getting arms out there. They're wreaking some havoc to, for as far back as they're getting pushed off, they're making more plays than you would expect, which is also a red flag because if you place a good offensive line, you can you, you might get even more blown off the ball and then all bets are off. I mean, there was a couple runs by Wisconsin where they just completely obliterated the front, uh, a little bit, three yards, and then the guy had like a free release, which we're not seeing for Kyle Manunga at all. So, I mean, I think that's where, again, if you if you had to say what position on the field outside of quarterback do you want the best to be on your team, to have a good team, it's probably defensive line, and they're just not there. They're not the Wisconsin's. They're not the Nebraska even on their defensive line. And so can you? how can you coach around that? And it feels like they've done it to some extent, but then their linebackers are not able to clean up plays like they were last year and then it also prevents them from slanting as much because when you start running more complex fronts you can occasionally challenge the linebackers to have to be better because then they have to cover more ground be ready for more plays if guys are crossing up the middle there's more exposed and so i think they've avoided a lot of those slanting and other techniques up front because they're trying to protect their linebackers but it's actually backfired because instead offenses know exactly what they're going to see and much like we talked about the offense of Rutgers not changing their tempo, it feels like Rutgers getting victimized by other teams 
changing their tempo. Um, they've been quick snapped a few times. Um, the one other thing I just want to talk about with the front overall, a line and linebackers, the reason I knew they were in trouble immediately when I texted you on the first or second drive of the game was when Rutgers was getting caught um, like with substitutions and everything like that. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I say that is because they play strong side, weak side. And the reason that more teams don't do it is because all it takes is the offense putting one guy in motion or doing a shift and it completely changes everything. And so if you're not as experienced of a player, you're trying to figure out, okay, well now what do I do? Or if this guy goes in motion, even if he doesn't like, okay, do I need to completely switch my assignment? And so it does make things really complicated when Shiano's defense prides itself on being able to react quickly. And so by having these problems, I mean, that's, that's concerning to me. Yeah. That's that actually- just the alignment. Like every team is going to do what Wisconsin did run those shifts. And if anyone, Shiano should know it because I was rewatching the 2005 insight bowl and Rutgers was doing that to Arizona state for big yardage. Every time it was the same, they would move this guy, move that guy. Wisconsin did it on the, the second touchdown run where they shifted two tight ends to the right side. And then it was like, Flip Dixon had the the only guy who had a chance to make a tackle because the line, you know, it's it just, you know, you're flipping assignments, responsibilities. I mean, that's why teams don't do it and expect a heavy dose of that for the rest of the year because every team is going to realize that that's going to be a competitive advantage unless Rutgers, you know, substitutes less or gets better with their alignments. Yeah, great points. I think uh, that emphasized a big part of what Wisconsin was doing is they were great at changing the tempo. Uh, and, and changing different things that they were doing. Uh, Phil Longo, obviously, that offense starting to click now. Uh, and Rutgers just seemed off balance the whole time. And, and I think that is a good transition to linebackers because I think that speaks to the lack of experience that they have. You know, we harped on Ture, obviously, being out. I think people forget Drew Singleton and all the experience he brought last year, as well as, obviously, Tyree Powell. And you don't have that quarterback of the defense out there to kind of pick up on things like that and be able to communicate uh, and not to mention that all three captains were out of the game uh, with uh, Powell, Ture, and Longer Beam. Uh, before we go to the linebackers, I just want to give an injury update because there are quotes out now from Shiano's presser, which I'll have out on YouTube uh, as well by the time you're listening to this. But uh, in terms of being asked about the health of Longer Beam, Powell, Lewis, Kenny Fletcher, Sam Brown, Flip Dixon, uh, Shiano said, quote, uh, evaluating everything right now with medical Going to get into all of that, the pregame availability report on Saturday. I mean, he's not telling us anything, but his extended quote was, quote, certainly we're banged up. We've lost a couple more, and we'll get into that stuff Saturday with the availability report. It'll be a challenge. We're not in a great spot with our health right now, but that doesn't matter, unquote. So that obviously doesn't sound good, uh, and we don't want to necessarily speculate who those two guys might be. Uh, But at any rate, we know Rutgers is going into a must-win game against UCLA. Uh, with a lot of significant injuries. Uh, maybe that does tie into part of our conversation here about linebacker overall thoughts so far. Yeah, I mean, uh, last year you had Jennings, Ture, and Powell play the majority of the snaps and do a very good job. You're coming off a period of time where you mentioned Drew Singleton, Fogg, Maddox Williams, mm-hmm. Ola Kuli, Fadokasi, obviously. You're coming off of a stretch where – your linebackers were able to come and cover up for deficiencies on the line, as well as some inexperience in the defensive backfield, which allowed a lot of the, the defensive backs to kind of age into their roles, like a like a Igbenosin or Loyal. I mean, yep. they were protected by these linebackers earlier in their careers. Now they don't have the same protection, basically, and you're relying on Jabomi and Moses Walker. Now, first of all, I will say Moses Walker played better that might've been his best game actually this past week. I've been really hard on him all season. And I think that he was not the bigger problem against Wisconsin, but he's just not that big. So if he gets against like a, a line, a lineman that's big, he's, he's going to have trouble defeating that block. Now he's still recovering from an injury. It's possible that next year he's better. It's possible that he's stronger, you know, whatever. But Jabomi, uh, I believe is the one who's calling the signals basically as a linebacker now. And, he has some plays where even he makes the wrong read and he can blow up a lineman. There's a couple plays against Wisconsin where he did take a, an offensive lineman head on and succeed, but then there's also plays where he got destroyed. And then he also made a couple missed tackles where he just got juked entirely by a, a running back when he was in good position. 
And so I think it's just a lot of ups and downs and it's just, they're just not where they need to be. If you had Jabomi next to, like you saw, even when Powell was able to play yeah. and, and Jabomi is next to him, he's clearly part, played a lot better in those spots against Washington, even against Nebraska. Uh, but without that, it's just really hard running with those two guys. Timmy Hines better. He, again, I think he got held egregiously once he, also made a play where he was trying to set the edge on that second touchdown run, and he ultimately did it, but he couldn't get in position quick enough for Flip Dixon to trust that he Dixon should go inside. He was more concerned about the outside to the last possible second, so he didn't have the full head of steam. Whereas if it was a linebacker that he may have trusted, he may have trusted that Heinz Bitter would have set the edge like he ended up doing. So there's some some minor things there. Uh, Abram Wright absolutely clobbered. Uh, Braden Locke on one play and just kind of one of kind of those days, the ball kind of fluttered right into a receiver's hands, even though Shaquan Loyal was right on the guy. So I think Abram Wright, maybe you need to work him in more. Maybe you need to rotate these guys more so that they you can maybe talk to him on the sideline and get him up to speed. Maybe we're undervaluing the loss of Corey Heatherman as a linebackers coach, because maybe that responsibility on Harris Miak, this is not a good year for it because the, you got more guys you need to work with. I mean, it could be a lot of things. Uh, but ultimately, you know, Jabomi is the only one who brings that superior skill set physically to the table to overcome if he's blocked or if he's slightly out of position. And even then, you know, he has the ups and downs of a first year starter at linebacker. So this is pr- that's probably the biggest disappointment is the reason the people thought there was depth in that room is personnel had some snaps, had some physical ability, you got a four star recruit. And then this coaching staff having so much experience coaching up linebackers. I mean, they went into years with just Shiano and Bob Frazier coaching guys 15 years ago, and they're producing NFL players off of walk-ons. So yeah. that's probably the most discouraging thing defensively is just you would have thought you could have coached these guys up. And yeah, Ture was injured, but these guys got a full spring. They were keeping Powell and Ture out almost the entire spring, right? So I don't I don't know what more you could do heading into this year. And so I don't don't know. Maybe you're going to have to go to the portal heading the next year, or you just expect that Torrey's going to be back. I mean, if Powell's injury is significant, perhaps he somehow gets a red shirt. I know there's been rumors about that. Again, we don't know, but you know, I mean, they just, they just don't have a reliable linebacker. And you've seen even lacking physical ability on some of the guys on Nebraska, uh, Washington, Wisconsin, some of those guys lack the athletic ability, but they're just hitting their spot with good timing and making plays Rutgers just does not have that linebacker. And normally if your defensive line and defensive backs are good, you can get away with it at linebacker, but I don't think the defensive line is performing to a level to kind of ease the pressure on the linebackers so far this season. Yeah, very true. Excellent points. And I also think, you know, it's the same old story where, you know, epitomizing that, that start. I mean, the Rutgers offense, one first down in the first four, five drives, you know, just completely wearing down the Rutgers defense where they just fell apart in that second half. I think part of that, as we said, was, was a, a little bit of an effect of the Nebraska game, but also they were on the field so much in that first half and took such a beating that, uh, you know, they, they're not getting that help from the offense in terms of even not to even just scoring points, but even just sustaining drives to keep them off the field. And we've seen that story so many times now at Rutgers over the last decade plus or decade in the Big Ten uh, where the defense just wears down over time uh, because of the, the lack of offensive output. Uh, moving on to the secondary cornerbacks, overall thoughts so far. Yeah, I mean, I think Al Shadi Salam, I've been hard on him. The one pass that he got burned on early in this game against Wisconsin was a dime. I mean, it was a beautiful pass. And then, other than that, I mean, Bo Masco, I think he just kind of like we talked about Jabomi and Walker. He's had the ups and downs you would expect of a guy who's in his first significant reps. He's had some great plays. I uh, forget if it was this game or two weeks ago where he made a great shoestring tackle, possibly to save a touchdown, and then he gave up a completion on the subsequent play that deep, might have even been a touchdown, and you're like, well, that was for not, not I guess. I think it was the Wisconsin game, yeah. But at the same time, I mean, when I see him, when I see Masco, I see – Okay, this to me reminds me of a- of uh, Avery Young, where he's physically bi- big enough. He's got a nose for the ball. He plays tough. At worst, he will be able to perform like Avery Young as he continues to get more experience, which is like, yeah, maybe you don't trust him as a pure corner, 
Maybe he's not perfect as a safety, but as a defensive guy and you're too deep, you know, you're going to trust him as he continues to gain more experience. And I think that he's given you what you expected and more. Eric Rogers, I mean, has been banged up when he's been healthy. He's been as good as last year. Robert Longerbeam, again, when healthy, has been basically as good as he was last year. Um, and as much as it's been a little bit of a struggle, like when you look around the country, other teams are getting much less production out of their defensive backs. Even when you have a transfer in Rodgers, you've got a guy in his first significant action in Masco. Salam's never really played there either. I mean, basically, the only guy who you've had since the beginning of his career who is an even solid three-star recruit is Longerbeam. And so with that as your cornerbacks, what they have been able to get is pretty good. I mean, we expect, you know, not to give up any completions. But if you look again, watch around the country, every cornerback gives up uh, completions. At the safety spot, I think that Loyal and Igbenosin have been – about where maybe a slight step up from last year. I think if we want to talk developmental program, a guy like that, solid three-star recruit, should get a little bit better each year. It seems like they're a little bit better. I think Igbenosin had a few bad plays early against Wisconsin, but then as the first half wore on, he did a good job. I mean, Loyal gave up the touchdown, but again, like that was a pretty nice pass. And then yeah. he comes back with the interception on a, another complete duck from Locke. You know, so... I mean, I think this is what you expect from 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 safeties who have a lot of responsibilities in the run and pass game. And then Dixon just hasn't been 100%. Again, I'm seeing Kaj Sanders get better every week. He made a touchdown saving tackle early in the game uh, on that play that Jabome kind of whiffed on. And so again, he's getting better too. So I'm very bullish long term on the secondary because they're not the reason this team's losing losing the last two weeks. Absolutely not. I mean, the other teams get to make plays. They're going to make passes into tight windows from time to time. You can't stop everything. And so, again, I, I don't – this defensive backfield is not like the level they were with the Logan Ryan, Marcus Cooper, Brandon Jones, or even a couple years ago, even the Kai Hester, Saquon Hampton one, where you had three future pros. And they're not necessarily the defensive backfield that you had last year because you had Max Melton and healthy Longer Beam and Rodgers. But as problems go on this team, they're not the problem. The goal, hopefully, is that they can make a few more plays, maybe a pick here or there, but, I mean, again, I, they need to be better, but they're not the reason that the team has been struggling the last couple of games. I mean, even against Washington, they missed some tackles, but they avoided giving up big plays against a really prolific passing attack. Now, I guess they're not as good as Iowa, who just demolished Washington the other day. <laughs> but, you know, is, I guess the question that we should be asking ourselves is, is this position group giving you a chance to go 9-3 and three, or at least 8-4? and four? And in the defensive backfield, the answer is an absolute yes. They're a reason that you're doing that. I don't think they're playing to a level that would allow you to go 10 and 2, either, you know, even going at the beginning of the season. But I mean, they're not the reason that your team is going to, you know, struggle to win another couple games this year. Yeah, great points. I mean, you just highlighted why I think the secondary has been the most consistent group in the Shiano 2.0. Uh, you know, calling Rutgers DBU, I mean, it really isn't a joke. And, Shout out to the players you didn't mention, Christian Izzian, Christian Braswell, Avery Young. I mean, they all saw time uh, and are seeing time in the NFL. I mean, it, it, this has been a consistent, productive group. And you're right, th there are some misses there. But uh, Igbenus and Loyal, I just I love the way they play. And they do come through with big plays uh, right. in every game. And you're right, they do make some mistakes, but they don't allow the big uh, plays. Uh, when they do make mistakes, they're not, you know, typically killers that put you behind. Uh, and you're right. I think the secondary group, uh, maybe they haven't elevated this team to that next step, but they certainly haven't put them in a hole as well. And I think that they've held a pretty, I think the concern now is that if the linebackers continue to be, uh, you know, at the level they're at without Powell coming back, if that's the case, if the defensive line continues to wear down more and more onus is going to be on that secondary, depending on Flip Dixon as well, longer beam, you know, they could tip, they could potentially wear down as this season goes on. Yeah, I think the biggest concern looking at the back half of the season is even if they play well, they might just not be able to have the talent to man for man, you know, with the injuries hold up against a team like USC. I mean, we saw how they struggled against Maryland last year. Maryland returned some of the same contributors at receiver. So that's going to be obviously tough. So it's possible that they will get more exposed as the season goes on. But, you know, again, I think that 
they they also did a concerted effort, and one of the reasons they struggled late against Wisconsin, they put a lot of other guys in. I mean, Kevin Levy was in there, the freshman. There were some other guys in the defensive backfield not taking good angles, getting their first significant action. So there, there might be a need for more guys. I mean, but another – I mean, Igbenosin and Loyal, they went from basically being your – let's say if you were a baseball batting lineup, they would be your six, seven in the eight spot batting. And then with all these other guys out, now they're your two best guys. Like that's – they're not all t- Big Ten performers. So that's really where you're seeing the overall struggle of the defense. It's not against something against them personally. Like if they stayed in, again, a baseball analogy, if they're staying in the six or seven hole in the lineup, that's a lot different than having to be the leadoff man or bat third. And yeah. so we'll see what happens with them later in the year. But uh, I, I think that, you know, the pipeline at defensive back, maybe we need to see more of, uh, Clog is or Zion Williams or somebody, but those guys haven't just stepped in and gotten burned. I mean, Salam struggled a little bit two weeks ago, but I, you know, I, I think there's hope there. He has the physical ability to step up, but defensively, again, maybe even on the whole team, I think defensive back is the least of your problems, despite facing equal, if not more injuries than any other group. Yeah. Excellent point. And in terms of the safety group, I mean, uh, it's an excellent point about them not being uh, at the top of your personnel, but they have been very solid and you lose all three next year. So that just speaks to the need to replace so many players uh, on this defense next year, uh, specifically that defensive back group with, you know, longer beam and Rogers as well. So uh, perhaps getting more guys in or, or due to health at a necessity that could help in the long run. But again, it doesn't necessarily uh, raise your ceiling for this particular season. Uh, any last thoughts on the defense before we move to special teams? No, I think we've said enough. <laughs> All right, special teams obviously has not been at the level we're used to. Uh, I think I'll kind of run through it quick, then you give your thoughts. Punting, I think Anderson, honestly, he's been fine. I think we've been spoiled by, uh, you know, Ryan Anderson and then Adam Corsack. I think uh, Jacob Anderson, he's not the prettiest punter in the world, uh, but overall, I think he's done his job. He hasn't been a detriment to this team. Uh, place kicking, Jay Patel, I think he's gotten some, you know, I, I don't think the staff has managed him very well. Obviously, you have two blocks now, one that counted, one that didn't. Uh, it was a bad hold uh, on Saturday, but you have to wonder what his confidence level is right now. And then just in terms of no, no return game at all by choice, which just is baffling to me in terms of, you know, lowering your big play ability uh, potential and really negating this team's ability to come back or, you know, surprise and kind of uh, have another element to this team. In terms of Bo Melton and Aaron Crookshank, I mean, that was a true weapon for Rutgers in special teams. They don't have that right now. And then obviously coverage has been a little bit of an issue as well. They had a couple blocks, uh, but they've missed some as well. Overall, I think special teams has been worse than last year. Uh, overall thoughts on this unit? Yeah, I mean, I'd say they're probably Big Ten average, not Big Ten elite. Right. Uh, Anderson, for example, punter, like you said, he, he's actually had a higher average than Flynn Appleby last year so far, and he didn't even have spring practice. Perhaps the issue, I mean, the holding. I think that teams have gotten a little too comfortable with their punter being a holder. And I'm not saying he has bad hands because he's got experience in Australian rules football, which you have to be able to catch and kick the ball. But, I mean, that experience, lack of experience showed up and a kick that was blocked last week. You have a, a snapper who you trust, but he made not a perfect, not a ter- not the worst snap in the world. A good holder could have made it, but it should have been a better snap. So that's con- disconcerting because, like you said, with Patel, it was it would have been nice in that spot. I think everyone in the stadium on on TV was like, "Please just get a confidence kick in, right? Yeah. Just go into the half, get a three points." Instead, it was going the other way. So obviously, a huge problem. And I, I don't think you can blame the blocking because the kick was so late. I mean, you yeah. can only protect for so long in field goal protection unless they're in a safe, like a field goal safe. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not. That's not why they're losing games. The kicker and the punter. You even saw the Wisconsin kicker miss the exact same kick yeah. uh, from the right hash that Jay Patel missed against Virginia Tech. Almost identical situation. Up fourteen, nothing. Misses the kick. Right. It was almost the exact. It was like deja vu. Uh, in the return game, I think that this is a factor of and in the blocking game uh, for blocking kicks. I just think it takes the soul a little bit away from your team when you're so convinced that like we're going to win by attrition and you're not, 
it's yeah. fine if you're, you know, Alabama and you're like, all right, we're not going to return a kick because you're not losing games other than against Vanderbilt. But if you're not that level, what does Rutgers have? They had the mojo. They had the enthusiasm. Like, you look at that those games in 2005, 2004, there's no way if you told Greg Schiano, like, that he would in 15, 20 years just not even try to return a punt or a kick. He would look at you like you're insane. You know, almost like in Terminator when it's like, who sent you? You did. Like, it would, it would be like – insane like the reaction on his face if you if you try to tell him that and so i mean even with the punting right those rugby style kicks were good and then i don't know what the heck they were doing when they then rolled anderson to the left and then he shanked that one it was working keep kicking from the right side then they go right back to it and the guy fumbles the very next kick like what are we doing like it seems like this team just can't accept success at certain times when they're doing something that's working whether it be offense or special teams and so that's my biggest concern with special teams is I think you're just taking away part of the team's identity by not being aggressive on special teams. And I think it's, it's, it's having ripple effects because I mean, last comment on this is just the, when you look at the overall composite team talent, right? We think Rutgers is the middle of the pack. No, by every consensus, if you look at pure like star ratings for their 85 highest rated guys, which I know some are walk-ons, or whatever, but they are still 16th or 17th in the Big Ten. Now, Indiana is winning more games with a similar level of talent, to be honest. But you're not you, you're not going to just line up, man up against most Big Ten teams and win. So you either have to be perfectly buttoned up, no turnovers, no mistakes, or you need to, and or you need to bring the mojo on like playing hard on both sides of the ball, hitting people hard, being the aggressor, especially on special teams. And I think they're not doing that. And I think part of that is sinking the fans in the crowd, especially at home games. And I think part of that is just going into these drives where how can you call a fair catch and then have a delay of game on first and 10 twice. And that was why fans were saying this was literally a game out of the ash era, because that is completely ridiculous. And rather than, you know, forcing the action on special teams and offense, you're letting the other team dictate to you what they're going to do. And I think this helmet, you know, communication is starting to have a negative effect because they're being a little bit too reactive uh, on offense. And I think that part of that is in the same vein as special teams. So all that being said, I mean, I went into the season predicting eight and four and really that's seven and five, because I always tell you, you're going to lose a game that you probably should have won. So do I think this team is still in line for that? I'm not sure. I will know a lot more with this game against UCLA. And so without with the talent that you have, which is not, again, top tier Big Ten, you've got to be buttoned up in these areas, which they have not been the last two weeks. And until you continue to get more of that, you've got to scheme ways to win games. We've seen plenty of teams do it around the country for the last couple of weeks. We saw Rutgers do it against Washington in a game where they had the complete talent disadvantage. But what can they do the rest of this season to at least get to a bowl game Win some games when you can win them. We, I mentioned this earlier in the year. you got to win when you can win. You never know when injuries are going to happen. You never know when bad weather is going to strike. You never know when something bizarre is going to happen. You've got to stack up wins while you can. And right now we're in a place where the opposite is true. you got to just find a way to win a game even when your team is reeling. you got to come up with something. And the passion that Shiano's teams of years past have played with, I didn't see that last game. I thought the defense hung tough for a half, but I didn't see it. And so that's where we need them to play that way the rest of the season. And then it'll cover up a lot of these issues that we were very critical of during this uh, podcast. Well said. And that's what was so disheartening about that Wisconsin loss. I I picked them to lose that game before the season. I like you picked them to go eight and four. I picked them to start four and four. Uh, So it's not panic time, but it's the way in which they lost that game. That was so uh, upsetting. And to your point about special teams, I mean, it is that X factor. Uh, and what's crazy is you're, you're talking about Shiano going back to his past 20 years ago. I mean, the way this team won six and seven games last year with special teams, with the three blocks for three touchdowns, the comeback against Michigan State, two huge plays on special teams, including that turnover with the ball in the air. Yeah. I mean, the, if you told Shiano last year, like, I, I just, I don't know if it's maybe a depth thing where he's concerned about losing guys on special teams. So maybe. he's playing so conservatively. 
but it, I, I agree. I think it's messing with their mojo and you're also taking away, uh, you know, you, you're making the, the margin of error in all three phases so much uh, thinner because you don't have those X factor potential plays that you're going for uh, on special teams. Uh, and, you know, you've killed the confidence of your kicker along the way. So uh, it's very frustrating from that perspective. Although I agree, they're, they're probably still about average in the Big Ten. Um, if, from a Rutgers perspective, that's been a, a step backward from last year. For sure. So to end this, let's talk about coaching and just any last thoughts you have. Yeah, I think that they've kind of outsmarted themselves a couple times this year. Kind of clearly they've overestimated their personnel on offense. That's obvious. Defensively, I think for the most part, they've been coming into games with a game plan that generally worked. I mean, even against Virginia Tech, I mean, that was kind of a momentum thing. They've got some playmakers. Against Washington, they had the only game plan they could have had to win that game, I think, on defense. Nebraska, they had a good defensive game plan. They really gave up, what, two big plays all game? Yeah. And then even in this game against Wisconsin, after there's a sequence where Wisconsin ultimately missed a field goal, they also really forced a punt, even when Wisconsin had crossed midfield, like they did tighten up a few times. So really, I think they got to just go back to, like Shano said, uh, I guess – this is going to be controversial, but I guess I'll say it anyway. I do think Luke Fickle is a better, like, in-season coach. I mean, in-game for sure, but in-season for sure. Uh, he, he is a step a bit better. And he knew what he knew what to expect. They were so prepared for that game. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I think Luke Fickle is a better program builder. And so you're going to have to just figure out how to win some games this year and then continue to build the program year after year. Because – like we talk about in the NFL, you lose, you get a higher draft pick. But in college, if you lose, there's no positive to losing a game pretty much ever in, yeah. at the college level. So, I mean, that's what I would say about Shiano. Again, I think Harris Simiak maybe overestimated the uh, additional responsibilities that he's had to have coaching linebackers. Again, I haven't spoken to him personally about it. But if I had to look from the outside, like these guys need more hand holding at the linebacker spot. And then again, I've already said a lot about Kirk Shiraka, where I just I just really am still struggling to figure out how you can have a game like you had this past week. His offensive scheme, with how so much success they've had in his career, I, I, I'm still almost not dumbfounded, but I'm still very surprised at how much they struggled in that game. Hopefully it's just the one clunker of the year. Um, but, I mean, now that we've seen it two weeks in a row, if it happens again this week, you're going to have to say this just is what we are. So this is a huge game for the offense, especially to, I mean, really, if they don't win this game, they're never going to get another better chance this year. Uh, I know they're better about regrouping with the bye, whatever, but you have to win this game or else things are really going to start to spiral out of control. In terms of the defense, you know, to your point, Rutgers got the ball back after that. They got the stop out of, out of the half. They had the ball down 14 nothing. I mean, the defense to that point, although not perfect, was still keeping them in the game midway third quarter. And that's yeah. when it started to unravel on that first drive of Rutgers with the ball. They couldn't do anything. Defense was right back on the field. They gave up that big run and then that big pass. And then it right. was all she wrote. So I agree. I, I don't think I – th I think the defense has had some bad luck too a little bit there. But I guess something you said I want to ask you, and we haven't even talked about this, but yes, Shiano is a proven program builder. Is that – now moving forward negated to a point because of the emergence of nil obviously revenue sharing is on its way and that will level the playing field somewhat but in terms of the big 10 the dynamics of the big 10 the programs that have those nil collectives built up are still going to have a major advantage um you know as a program builder right and that's his expertise does that still allow him to lead Rutgers to success with a lack of nil and, and just limits the ceiling? Or do you think that it, it do, it's not going to make up ground that if these other programs, maybe with, with worse coaches from a program building perspective, but with the greater resources, that that's going to negate Shiano's strength as a coach? It's an excellent question. And my answer would be, if you can build your offensive and defensive line, I think it's fine. If you can't, there's no quick fixes, and it's going to be even harder in the long term to do that. 
Yep. So that's kind of why I'm so bullish on the program. If they can keep this recruiting class, you know, mostly intact is because there's so many linemen in this group. And I know we talked about that class of seven linemen that has kind of fallen apart as a whole. These guys are so much better. I mean, it, perhaps the other discouraging thing is even of the 23 class, they're not getting contributions there on the offensive line. I mean, I, I think we've spoke Pat Flaherty's phrase, uh, praises, but I mean, they got to figure out how to have more offensive linemen. And if you can do that, then you can get by if you can't afford to pay a big time quarterback. If yeah. you can't, then you got to pay a big time quarterback. I think that's, I think, and or a big time office of coordinator. And if you pay a big time office of coordinator who's young, they're going to go into another job anyway. And so that's why I think that being a good program builder still matters, but you can't be in the place they're in on the offensive and defensive line and expect that you're going to get by. I mean, this year, their schedule is not particularly difficult. You don't have games against Iowa, Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan who would be a guaranteed loss if they were playing any of those teams the rest of this year, period, end of story. There's no way they can compete on the lines with those teams. But you don't face any of them. So if you can just get through this year with what you have, then maybe you can come up with some ways in the offseason, another year of development, especially with bowl practice, maybe some of the younger guys, you know, step up, you know, Stone, Oliveira, Rivera, right? Those guys where I wouldn't expect them to, co to compete until their third year in the program anyway. And so maybe, maybe then you have some guys that can play next year that can't play this year. I'm not sure. But if you can keep, if you can come up with a way on the lines to do it, I think – it will be fine. If you can't, all bets are off. Yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. And I think that's where my frustration comes in. And obviously the wheels have kind of fallen off the offensive line the last two games. But, you know, the the, the way the whole offense is built is around an offensive line that can produce a run game. And you right. don't have that. And there doesn't seem like there's a plan B. Uh, and, and that's why it's concerning the second half of the season now. I think it's going to be very much matchup based on whether they have a chance to win or not. Obviously, UCLA, one of those teams, I think they do have a, a chance to win uh, against. They're not good against the run. They're not a typical Big Ten front seven uh, defense. Uh, but those are going to be few and far between as we go here. And I think uh, just having more of a uh, versatility as an offensive scheme, as an offensive uh, identity, uh, would, would really come into play right now. And, and again, you're right. And I harped on it before. I mean, building up these lines that Rutgers is, it, they're going to be spinning in circles for, for out time until they elevate their, their, their play on both sides of the line. And until you do that, and you're right, the 25 class is very hopeful. Uh, but again, you can't expect those guys to contribute next year either. So uh, it's, it's certainly, I think, a big question mark for this program overall long term not just this year, but what you get out of that moving forward. Obviously, injury is a factor, um, but also, yeah, what can Shiraka uh, dial up offensively? Is it going to be the same stuff that we're just going to hope is going to work against different opponents or not? Remains to be seen. Uh, I, like you, I still think they're going to get to a bowl game. I still think they can get to seven wins. I think eight is possible. Uh, you know, we'll see. But I think that bye week going into November is, is obviously going to be huge here for this team. But if you don't get the win this week, the wheels are really going to start to fall off the perception, uh, the negativity. It, you can't be insulated. You know, Shano talks about insulating his team and away from all that. But it, it's going to be impossible at that point, I think, to do that. Uh, which just may, and, and the thing I think people are underestimating, we'll get into this in our game preview. But UCLA, I mean, their losses are all against really good teams. So they, they're not going to be some pushover coming in. Uh, Rutgers is going to have to be emotionally ready to play. They're going to have to be physically ready to play. Uh, the second half of the season starts now. And uh, for them to get close to what we had hoped they would this year, uh, this is something that their coaching staff is going to have to figure out this pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, the last thing I'll just say is, again, in Chiraca, this, this team will, will win or lose games by how functional their offense is. Pretty much. I mean, special teams, defense matter, but if you're not an elite special teams unit or elite defense and you're just roughly average, you go as far as your offense. And when I look back at that game, again, I'm being a little harsh but be, on Chiraca, but he schemed guys open. They were open. 
In that first half, at one point, Kelly Mass was, I think, five of nine, and he had three absolute drops and one where he kind of threw it in the dirt, but it was because of pressure. I think yeah. he probably could have got the ball off, but, you know, oh, I don't know. There's one bad one where he didn't see a, 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 a safety, and it could have been picked. Fine. Yes. So he did have that, uh, but so did the other team's quarterback. He threw a pick. He could have had three or four early in the first half. And so I'm not sure what you can do to scheme your receivers open that much more than you already are. They're just not catching the ball in, in this past game. So, again, I you can't – but then you can't not call pass plays because then they're just going to stack the run. So I, I think they just need – I don't know how these guys draft passes, by the way, with the gloves they wear. It's unbelievable. Like we saw when I first saw the gloves in college, when we got a shipment, I was like, there's no way these guys can drop the ball. But subsequently those gloves are a little too sticky. So they're like, you can't block. You'll get caught for holding too often. So they have to scale back the stickiness factor. So they're not just like wearing stick them on your hands, but still with the gloves they have, I mean, they got to catch the ball, but yeah. it's just concerning when Kelly managed struggled with his receiver dropping passes last year too. Like, is there something else going on here? Um, but again, I, I don't think Chirac is as bad as he looked last week because right. of how many drops they had in the first half. I mean, four official, and it was really like seven, if you want to count other passes that would have been caught by Wisconsin receivers against a, a contested defender. Like, So, yeah, I think there's just some regression to the mean, but that doesn't mean you can just rely on the law of averages to bail you out to win a few games. Like, there have to be other structural changes to this offense coupled with a little bit of better luck and some hanging on to the ball. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe we'll look back at that week against Wisconsin as just that annual clunker that we've talked about. Uh, and this team is much better than they looked against Wisconsin, but certainly alarming from a progression standpoint. We thought we were kind of past those really bad losses uh, and the way in which it all went down. Uh, and hopefully the staff still looks to evaluate and make changes the way Shano said they did and not just chalk it up to, you know, burn the film, bad clunker, uh, and try to do the same thing week after week. A lot of football yet to be played. Uh, Rutgers 4-2, and 1-2 and two could be a lot worse. We feel like it could be better. Uh, how they finish the season will ultimately determine a lot about the program in terms of the future. Uh, and as a fifth year of Shiano with this developmental program, and so many players in the last year of the development. Can they come through? Can they stay healthy? A lot of questions remain. David Anderson, as always, thank you so much for being here. We'll talk again for the UCLA preview later in the week. And thank you all for listening and watching once again here at the Scarlet Faithful Podcast.